We're back with Professor of the Idiot, episode number four. Okay, Nick, before we get started on our subject today, I want to ask you a question. Which president throughout history in their physical prime would have the best chance to beat you in a fight? Uh, I have two answers to this question, two presidents. The first is Abe Lincoln, who was a wrestler and champion of his county uh, when he was a young man. I've heard those stories before. Yeah. So, uh, and wrestling, I'm sure, was a very different sport then. It may have been more akin to catch wrestling. That is not only pinning someone, but submitting them. So I think Abe Lincoln would be a handful. The other uh, answer, I guess, is Gerald Ford, who was probably the most athletic president ever. He was an All-American football player at the University of Michigan in the uh, late 20s and early 30s and we even had an offer to play football in the nfl but then went on to uh go to law school instead i'm a little surprised you didn't say teddy roosevelt <laughs> you're right teddy roosevelt he did jujitsu yeah and i think he boxed as well yeah and he's crazy oh yeah yeah crazy yeah. does help oh yeah i mean there is yeah he's an amazing man in a single year while he was president, he also read 500 books. <laughs> That's the type of president I want. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was just an all-around impressive human being. He, I, Reading one account of him, uh, he was uh, there was an aide walking in the White House, and Teddy Roosevelt you know, secretly was sneaking behind him. Or he tried to walk across, uh, walk across the Potomac on a rope. While he was president? Oh, yeah. While, while we brought up Lincoln, there's this quote that I've heard many times, and I did, do want to address it by Lincoln. Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. And I just want to say this. Lincoln clearly doesn't know shit about sharpening an axe, because it shouldn't take you four hours. <laughs> and I just want to say that. Ah. Uh. There's always the possibility that he was speaking metaphorically. Uh, nope, I'm taking it literally. Lincoln, you suck at chopping trees. <laughs> <laughs> or sharpening axes. Yeah, that is true. All right, um, our subject today is on guns, gun control, Second Amendment, all things pertaining to this subject. Okay, sounds good. Do you have a question? Um, where do you... Why do you think, okay, I guess we should start from the beginning, why do you think the Founding Fathers um, wrote the Second Amendment? My first argument here is that the Second Amendment doesn't mean what people think it means. So, let me read the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So, what does it mean? So, that's like basically one big sentence? One big sentence. So, one there's big, only problems. Yeah. Right. So, it could mean two things. An individual right to bear arms or the right for each state to have a militia. That is, the National Guard. Okay. So, I... Start by noting that from 1888, when law review articles were first indexed, through 1959, every single article on the Second Amendment concluded it did not guarantee an individual right to bear uh, a gun. Uh, someone actually, this actually, the idea of the Second Amendment referred to an individual right to have a gun, appeared in print for the first time in 1960. Okay. So, I can let me go on. Okay. Uh, so, flash forward to the 70s. In 1977, there was a coup on the executive board of the NRA. The NRA did, it was a long-standing organization for hobbyists and hunters, and 
until 1977, they always supported gun control. So too did the Republican Party. It was on the platform. But hardliners seized control in 1977 uh, and started sponsoring researchers to make the case that the Second Amendment actually referred to an individual right to bear arms. Uh, so in a 1980, a Supreme Court decision passingly noted that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual's right to have a gun only if it bears, quote, some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. And finally, in 2008, in a case called the District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court for the first time affirmed that the Constitution actually supports an individual right to bear arms. Okay. So this is a brand new interpretation. That's uh, see, I earlier today I tried looking up like quotes from the founding fathers yeah. about the Second Amendment, yeah, and it seemed like there's a lot of misinformation and quotes that aren't really real. <laughs> and, and I was searching for a good solid ten minutes, and I was just scrolling down. You know, I just googled Second Amendment quotes, founding fathers, right, and I couldn't find a website that I really trusted. Yeah. <laughs> Because they're all either like pro gun or anti gun. I was more right. looking for like history websites, like straight to the document source, right. and right. I didn't. It was hard for me to find anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is definitely a polarized debate. I should preface this by saying I'm a gun owner. Uh, I enjoy shooting, and I think it's. Enjoying shooting is deep in our American DNA and enjoying gun ownership. I don't want to seize anyone's guns. Now, let me continue my legal tour. So, Chief Justice Warren Burger, who is a conservative appointed by Richard Nixon, after he retired in 1991, said in an interview that the Second Amendment ha has, quote, been the subject of one of the greatest pieces of fraud. I repeat the word fraud on the American public by special interest groups I had ever seen in my lifetime. In other words, Warren Burger, a conservative, also didn't buy that the Second Amendment guaranteed an individual right to own a gun. So this is a new idea, and I'll point out that it's a new idea developed by conservatives. And conservatives are usually the ones who argue against activist judges and are always in favor of interpreting the Constitution as it was written and not changing it. But here, they rewrote the Constitution on this. Um, so when, when they wrote the Second Amendment and they used the word militia, yeah. I think the... Maybe the word militia meant a different thing back then because, you know, they had Minutemen. Right. I mean, basically they basically had farmers who had guns that were ready to grab their guns and gear to go fight the British. But, you know, the National Guard today is a very different thing than what a militia was back in those days. So that part of the Second Amendment is generally understood to mean what became the National Guard. The Founding Fathers envisioned that the United States would have a small uh, standing army, would avoid the endless wars the Europeans always seem to get themselves in, and that our primary army would be the National Guards. In other, in other words, the well-regulated militias. Yeah, so only a defensive type of military. Well, not even that. Just that it wouldn't was the different the difference between having national guards and having a large standing army. Okay. Okay. So, but I don't think that part of the Second Amendment is much disputed. I will. One thing that many gun supporters do is they go through and they cherry pick the founding fathers for sentiments that seem to support an individual right to bear arms. And you can certainly find them. You can certainly find founding fathers saying, uh, what is a, I'll Google quickly the quote by Patrick Henry, who had a very strong, uh, who had a very strong statement. 
he said, a free people ought not only to be, be armed, but disciplined. No free man shall ever be disbarred the use of guns, and so forth. But cherry-picking quotes is not the same as determining their intent. Yeah, I wish I could go back in time and be part of the um, Constitutional Convention or... Uh, was that what it's called? Congre- whatever the convention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just to hear them talking about it, because obviously them putting it the Second Amendment is a top priority. I would love to have heard the conversations that were had. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing yeah. would be fascinating. Still, I just want to make this point that until recently, no one ever thought the Second Amendment guaranteed an individual right to own arms. That's a new, that's a new understanding. So I guess maybe the debate is, is it a right or a privilege? Right. Well, I think a lot of people certainly would argue it's a right. So here's some uh, statistics on gun ownership. One thing that's declined a lot is hunting. In the 1970s, probably about a third of Americans hunted. It's half that now. In the 1970s, about half of all Americans owned a gun, and it was almost always just a gun, one gun. Today, only about one out of every four Americans owns guns, but the average owner has three or four guns. So there's a big move towards fewer people having guns, but those people have a lot more guns. Yeah, I was doing some reading today, and that definitely seems to be the trend. Yeah, fewer... About 3% of American adults own roughly half the guns. These people, these super enthusiasts, own an average of 17 guns each. Do you think that, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That in itself doesn't seem problematic. The reasons they own all those guns seem problematic. Okay, the paranoia-type motives. Yep, yep, yep. So, while I enjoy guns and I enjoy shooting and think that's a part of American heritage, the thing I can't stand is the NRA for their activism. Let me quote from a letter from the mid-'90s that the then-president of the NRA, Wayne LaPierre, sent to its members. President Clinton's army of anti-gun government agents continues to intimidate and harass law-abiding citizens, as in Waco and the Branch Davidians. Today they're poking into a weapons cache. Tomorrow they'll be taking away everyone's right to free speech, right to free practice of religion, and every other freedom of the Bill of Rights. The new assault weapons ban gives jackbooted government thugs more power to take away our constitutional rights, break in our doors, seize our guns, destroy our property, and even injure or kill us. Not so long ago was in- unthinkable for federal agents wearing Nazi bucket helmets and black stormtrooper uniforms to attract law-abiding citizens. In other words, he just called the government and the FBI and the ATF a bunch of thugs and Nazis. Uh, it's a little extreme. <laughs> yes. Right. And uh, in response to that letter, George Herbert Walker Bush, the, the ex-president who recently passed on, canceled his membership in protest. Wow. Yeah. So what was the point of that letter? To make people think that the government is going to come take your guns, and so you should buy more guns. Now, the gun-loving enthusiast in me who has listened to a lot of conservative-type people, um, I guess their argument would be, you know, it's like death of a thousand cuts. You know, it's like if we don't fight hard right now, if, you, if we give up an inch, they're going to take a mile. Right. It's a slippery slope argument, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the argument I hear most right. often. It's like, yeah, magazine limits and you know these little things that a lot of people say, oh, we just want this, we just want this. But then it's like it's just going to creep in more and more and more. 
Right. So those arguments were frequently deployed against marriage equality. That is, if we legalize gay marriage, polygamy will be next, and soon men will be able to, to marry egg beaters, and then society will collapse. Um, I don't even have a problem with polygamy. <laughs> and I'm from Utah, you know. I was slightly involved with the Mormon church, so, you know, being from Utah, polygamy is a big uh, I don't know, a big talking oh. point with Utahans. Oh, yeah. Oh, cer uh, certainly, certainly. You know, as a liber libertarian, uh, if more than one person wants to get married, I don't, I don't know, there might be, like, legal issues or logistical type stuff that some that, that might cause problems, but as far as I, I don't care. <laughs> right. I mean, fundamentally, I don't care. I'm I'm with you on that. But there's two, there's a couple of problems. One is that often there's child abuse. Yeah, that seems to be. Uh... Now that's not ubiqu <laughs> that's not ubiquitous. Not every polygamous group does that. Some have made a you know a point of being very open about rejecting that, but that has happened. Uh, that... Yeah, I think the type of man that wants multiple wives, uh, good chance he's a creep. <laughs> <laughs> so the bigger argument against polygamy is my argument as a, as a demographer. There's a population problem. If one man has multiple wives, you run out of women. And that's led to the Lost Boys, kids who are just kicked out of their communities because there are not enough women to go around. Hmm. And that's, that's just an inescapable problem and no real solution to that problem. Yeah. So I have no problem, moral problem, with, or as they call it in California, polyamory. That's fine. Uh, but, you know, as long as there's no child abuse... And there's ultimately, if too many people do it, there will be population imbalances. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It just seems like a recipe for disaster. <laughs> even if, yep. even if uh, all parties are sane and it's all consensual, it just, it just doesn't seem like a good idea. Yep. So let's um, get back to guns. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, these slippery slope arguments, I think, are bullshit. And if you really buy slippery slope arguments... You can never do anything, right? We passed one small gun control law. Well, that's on the slope to confiscation. So I don't think it's it's just a warrant for an action if you really believe slippery slope, yeah. death by a thousand cuts. Logic. Well, no, there's also thousands of gun laws in America. Yep. You know, it's not the wild, wild west. There are a lot of laws involving guns. Yep, always have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess the one, as a gun owner and a, a supporter of the Second Amendment, if you interpret it as... <laughs> if you, yeah, I guess it depends on how you if, interpret it. If you misinterpret it. <laughs> yeah. It seems to me there's a growing number of people who are saying, no more guns. Like, so, I don't care about what you think. I don't right. care about what you think your right is. No more guns. So, confiscation has never been on the table, no matter what stray remarks Democratic politicians may occasionally make. It's never been seriously proposed. It would never happen. But there is, ever since the Parkland shootings, increased momentum behind having more gun control. And indeed, after that, there are some laws passed in, in Florida. So, the reason ultimately, a couple of reasons why very little happens in the gun control front is that one, the people who support gun contro control are less passionate than those who support gun rights. That's the yeah, first thing. I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Uh, second is the NRA's political power. They assign every politician a rating. They will announce this vote will be a scored vote, meaning it will contribute to your NRA rating. And especially for Republican politicians in very conservative districts, getting a bad NRA rating is, is death. You'll get a primary challenge. Wow. 
So it's that's just the problem of money fucking with our politics. Um, do, I get I, part of me, you know, the young people, the Parkland. I guess I'll just call it the Parkland generation. You know, that generation is going to become older and run for office. That I don't know. I, yes. It's kind of repeating the same thing. But the worry is there the it's going to become a majority of people who say no more guns and then those laws are going to come about and then the people who are still pro guns there's going to become a there's going to come a conflict and it's not going to be pretty you know it's another possibility that your amazon echo will come alive in the middle of the night and cut off your penis well <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope so, too. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think that's just paranoia that the NRA has been trying to feed. Okay. Uh, so, I, def- I do definitely think there is some of that. I, I've been to some gun shows, and I don't even know. I don't know if they still have it, but I've seen it on multiple occasions. There's a, a basically a cartoon-ish image of Obama and then underneath it, that's in quotes, and I know this is total bullshit, but it says, I want your guns. <laughs> and it's like, I, I don't believe he's ever said that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think if he did say that, that was out of context. Yeah. Oh, well, of so, course. Yeah, I, I've been to gun shows too. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. That's just paranoia. It's never going to happen. Um, one point I... Or I guess one, the latest aspect of the gun control debate I see is the assault rifles thing. You know, that's what most people who are pro-gun control seem to be focusing on. Um, So I think that's probably the biggest aspect of the debate going on today is assault rifles and high-capacity magazines, semi-automatic rifles. Um, What are your feelings on that? So I have two feelings. Part of me says, you know, why do citizens need to have tactical weapons like that? But then the other part of me says, those guns are fun to shoot. I've shot an M16. I've shot an AK-47. It's fun. And then if I'm more realistic about it, I point out that pistols are used in the overwhelming number of gun deaths in this country. Well over 80% of gun deaths are from pistols. So trying to legislate against assault rifles, I think, is not really getting to the problem. The same with mag- you know, magazine size. Every, yes. every time there's a mass shooting that makes the news, my response is, this is terrible, and maybe if it gets people thinking about better gun laws, it's good, but it's misleading because only about, depending upon how you define mass shooting, only about 0.4% of our gun deaths are a product of mass shootings. Yeah, I mean, it is a big story, and the quote, if it bleeds, it leads. Yep. definitely applies. I mean, the media just loves to put mass shootings uh, on the forefront of what they're broadcasting. Yep. Uh, yep. But my, my thought is always, man, you know, you know, pistols are so much easier to conceal. Yep. And, and it also doesn't take much time to change a magazine. Yep. So, so these little like nitpicking laws that some people think are, are going to make a world of difference. I just don't really see it happening. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you about the laws about clip size. Like in California, the maximum, the largest magazine you can have is 10 rounds. I don't see that as really helping too much. Yeah, I mean, no. I could have a backpack full of magazines, yeah. and it takes me two seconds to change it. Now, consider the case a few years ago where that crazy guy, the one who was later found not guilty by insanity, Jared Loeffner, shot the Arizona congressman, Gabriel Giffords, and a bunch of other people in Tucson. He, he was, he had a large capacity magazine, and he was tackled when he was changing magazines. But that case is really the exception to the rule. I don't, so I'm not really a big fan of these limits on magazine or clip sizes. 
Yeah, I just don't think it's an effective yep. law. I agree. You know, I, I agree. Um, and I've kind of had this debate with people I know who make the argument that, like, you don't need a, a gun like that. And I think pe- there's a misconception of how powerful those guns are. Um, in particular, the conversation I did have is, like, that that type of gun blows you away and, you know, does all this damage. And I just told them, like, you know, a deer rifle is probably twice as powerful as that. Uh, I, but, but who cares, right? They're both fatal. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's like yeah. you're nit- people want to nitpick these little details. Right. It's like, to me, it's like if you're against guns, you might as well be all in and be on, in the camp that says, let's take them all away. No, I, I don't agree with that either. <laughs> well, well uh, of the people that want to nitpick these little yeah. tiny things, it's like you're not going to make a difference with these little tiny things. Yeah, I think the people who actually want to take all guns away, that's, that's a really small percentage of the population that gets exaggerated for the consumption of NRA members and people on the right. Do you think that small percentage is growing, though? Uh, I Probably a little bit after after New, Newtown, Connecticut, and Parkland, but I think it's still insignificant. Here's a, a saying I'm really fond of. We should all use more often. Nut picking. And so the nut pick is just to take the craziest quote you can find from an otherwise sane person right, and say, see... This person's nuts, or all Democrats are nuts, or all Republicans are nuts. Yeah. And so, sure, you could you could nut pick people to find virulently pro or anti gun sentiment. You can cherry pick the founding fathers to find to find strong pro gun sentiment. But I don't think that's a intellectually honest enterprise. Yeah, I agree with that. Right. So. Do you think, Dalton, that there's a problem in the United States with guns? Um, n- no, not with guns itself. Um, you know, the, we've all seen the, or at least you and I have seen statistics on violent crime dropping, homicides dropping. Yep. Um, most of the fatal deaths are with handguns. I don't yep. see anybody wanting to ban handguns. I'm not really worried about it. I am slightly worried about um, diagnosing and treatment of mental health issues. I do think that should be talked about more, and I don't know what the solution is. Um, but And also a part of me wonders, you know, we're becoming more and more civilized, I feel like, I think, as technology increases and um, our quality of life seems to be increasing around the world. Yep. I don't. I don't think that violence will be. It's going to become less and less of an issue as time goes on, barring a catastrophic event knocks us back down to prehistoric <laughs> level technology. Something on a mass scale severely affecting our quality of life. I I only see people's interaction act, interactions getting more and more peaceful. So I'm not really too worried about guns and gun violence. I, I only see it getting less and less as time goes on. I'm worried about gun violence. Despite the trends you note, despite the fact that the crime rate has gone down a lot, that's great news and we should shout that from the rooftops, but just because the trend is in that direction doesn't mean it'll continue. And trying to predict the future, it tends to be folly. Uh, social scientists don't have a good record of doing it. People aren't good at predicting uh, recessions. So I don't, you know, hopefully it will continue in this way, but I don't know what's going to happen for sure. Okay. Yeah, so I would argue that America does need tougher gun laws just because of how many more gun deaths there are here compared to every other developed country. Children ages uh, 5 to 14 are 11 times more likely to be killed with a gun in the United States compared to other developed countries. Do those developed countries have 
even close to the amount of guns that we do? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, for the most part, no. Although Switzerland comes close. Switzerland has a lot of guns. And they don't have nearly the amount of violence. Nope. Or gun violence, at least. Nope. So Switzerland, everyone serves in the army, and after they're in the army, people often take their guns home. In fact, it used to be automatic. You got to keep your gun. Now you have to apply for it. But not only does that mean a lot of guns, but, you know, a lot of assault rifles. Yeah. But the difference is it's more regulated there than it is here. And I should also point out that there are a lot of studies that show uh, that in the United States, more guns equals more gun deaths. Uh, states that have higher rates of firearm ownership have higher homicide rates. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think the idea that uh, keeping a gun at home is going to keep you safe is folly. For every time a gun is used in the house in self-defense, there are seven assaults or murders, 11 suicide attempts, and four accidents all involving guns around the house. The crime victimization surveys, which uh, occur annually over 10 years, over a million Americans were interviewed. Uh, exactly one woman said she st stopped a sexual assault using a gun. A mass shooting in this country has never been stopped by an armed civilian. Never. Really? Because yeah. I could have swore I've heard some news stories about, like, stop before anybody was killed or well, stop? Even in, in process. Hmm. Right. It, yeah, it just hasn't happened. And so why is this the case? Why are guns, having a gun around the house, why is it so unlikely to help? And the answer is training. People who use guns in houses, like SWAT teams and Army Special Forces, they have extensive tactical training. It's not only extensive, they have to do it to keep sharp. Don't they have to have drills, practicing entering the house, with pop-up targets and all that? And most people who keep guns around the house and count on them for self-defense, hint, hint, haven't had that tactical training. <laughs> so something happens and you don't know how to use your gun. It's not intuitive. And if you don't believe me, Google accounts of professionals who have had tactical training, SWAT team guys, are, you know, Army Special Forces. That's a skill, using a gun when there's chaos and you don't know who's armed and you don't know who's a civilian and there's shots and there's smoke and there's screaming and then you have to make sure you shoot the right person. That's not easy. That's not intuitive. No, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my bed right now. There's a gun uh, one foot away from me. But I will agree with you that this idea that just because you have a gun, you're going to become John Wayne and um, easily disarm the bad guy. And especially in a public setting with a mass shooting, you know, I, yep. I, I have a pistol, but I'm, you know, I'm interested in getting my concealed weapons permit, but it's like you said, like I haven't had training. I have never been in a life or death situation like that. And I think it's very egotistical to think like, I'd be able to handle it. Yep. If I had a yep. gun, I would have stopped that guy. It's like, would you have? You know, even cops have a hard time. Yeah. Stopping bad guys, and they're shooting on the regular. They deal with high stress situations. Oh, yeah. A lot, a lot, lots of times. So. Oh yeah. I'm very, very hesitant taking my gun out into public. Yeah. I mean, there's routine accounts of two people blasting away at each other from 10 feet with pistols and missing every shot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my brother, he, you know, he was in the Navy, didn't do anything crazy. He was on an aircraft carrier. He, you know, Utah has an open open carry law, yeah. and he'll walk around all over town with a pistol out in the open on his hip and, I think he's batshit crazy for doing that. I agree. I think open carry laws are idiotic. Think back to 2016 and that asshole in Texas who killed the cops. There's a, a, a sniper. And yeah. so 
peep, this is it's an open carry state, and so the cops had to deal with plenty of civilians who just had guns. Yeah, yeah. I think it's well. I think it's just dumb because it puts a target on your back. <laughs> if you want to carry a gun, you want to keep it hidden so people, you know, people don't know you have a gun. <laughs> but he just wants to look cool, and I think he I think he likes causing a little drama or. You know, just because he can, he wants to. But yeah, um, I think edu- yeah, education and training, I think, is an understated thing when it comes to guns. Yeah, um, I've, I think I told you this story before. You know, my dad, I grew up uh, du- uh, duck and goose hunting as a kid, and when I was a younger kid, before he even hunted at all, my dad brought home a duck that he had shot. That um, he shot it was too close it was obviously with a shotgun it was too close and it basically destroyed the bird and he brought it home and he, he came to the house and says dalton come out here i want to show you something and he showed me this duck who's was just obliterated guts and gore and all that stuff and he and he and he showed it to me and he looked at me and says this is what guns can do that's, this that's is the, good this yeah. is the reality. This is why you don't play with them. This is why you don't point them at people. Yeah. This is why you're safe. Because look at how this duck looks. That's how a human can look. And I still remember that to this day. And that was, you know, almost 20 years ago. That's good. Good for your dad. That's a good lesson. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think education... I don't, I don't know how you would require it, but it should be more emphasized. Why not require it? In schools or um, just to get a gun? To get a gun. You know, I'm not against that. Uh, Joe Rogan had a great point. Uh, Chael Sonnen um, was on his podcast. And, and I mean, I, it's kind of hard to argue against this point. He's like, you know, to drive a car... You have to take tests and prove that you can drive a car and be witness driving a car and get a license. You know, you have to go through a process and that's just a car. Why wouldn't at least a similar criteria apply to a gun? So in California, you have to take a test. I flunked it the first time. (laughs) Is that written or? uh, Written. Okay. How many questions was it? About 30. Okay. Still, I think think it's gun ownership should be treated as a privilege and so i could imagine something much more extensive let me give you uh an example so there are about seven hundred thousand legal fully automatic civilian rifles in this country wow so they were mostly outlawed by a law in i think 86 or 87 but the ones that were already in private possession were grandfathered in. So you can buy them. But the law to get one, you have to get a license. Yeah. And none of those guns have ever been used in mass shootings. A legal, fully automatic firearm. Yeah, that is correct. The same with a silencer, for that matter. If you want a silencer in this country, you need a license. Okay. Um... That's it. So, I, I guess maybe the argument for those type of licensing stuff is the crazy people that want to shoot up schools in public places. That just creates a, a slight barrier for those people. Yeah. You know, if guns are yeah. just on every corner and any Joe Schmo crazy person can get one, yeah. this th- these little steps and um, provide a barrier to keep those people from getting those guns. Yeah, I would argue for much more stringent vetting for gun owners. So everyone who buys a gun should have to have the sale registered. Now, okay. yeah, I. so if you buy a gun at a gun show or for a private party, it's an unregistered sale, and I think all sales like that should be registered. But Instead, we have laws moving in the opposite direction thanks to the political pressure of the NRA. For example, in Florida, it is illegal for your doctor to ask you questions about your guns. Why would a doctor ask you about your guns? (laughs) Well, if you are suicidal, for example, he might ask, is there a gun in your house? No, okay. 
Uh, that includes I, like psychiatrists and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's very weird. <laughs> <laughs> what? That, that's. That, I think that's. That, yeah. That, well, that's very weird that that law would exist. Well, it exists because of the political pressures of the NRA. Now, what does that law accomplish? Anything? Probably not. It's it's virtue signaling, right? Yeah. It's you know it's a law that that's just posturing because it it motivates pro gun people to vote, gets them worked up, just like that 1990s letter about government thugs. Okay, so I certainly would support more laws, and I'm not worried about the slippery slope. If you really buy the slippery slope argument, it just means you can't do anything. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to argue against that, especially since we do have so many gun laws on the books. You know, it's not like there's nothing. So the whole give them an inch, they take a mile argument does pretty much fall apart because many inches have been given. Yep. Yep. I mean, they've been given, you know, throughout the 20th century, uh, at least there have been gun laws and gun seizures has never been on the books. So I don't think more regulation is going to, I welcome more regulation. I guess my fantasy would be uh, something that's used in other countries. I think the UK, where if you want to get a gun, you need personal references. You need and that's a, just like friends or family? Yeah, just a couple of friends and family to vouch for you. So, okay, so I guess the... I thought, I mean, I haven't done much research, but I thought you couldn't really get hardly any guns in the UK. Only, no. <laughs> I know you can hunt, yeah. but you have to like keep a gun in a locker of some sort. Is that not true? I don't know the gun specific gun laws, but in almost every country, you can get almost any gun you want. It's just very regulated. So, okay. for example, if you want to get a... Australia used to have no gun laws, and then there was a mass shooting in 1997, and they passed a lot of gun laws. For example, if you want to have a pistol at home, you have to engage in pistol shooting competitions once a month. Really? Yeah. So there are a lot of laws there. but That's kind of weird, a pistol shooting competition. Right. So I... It's just, why are there so many, just an unacceptably high number of homicides and suicides in this country? Well, the suicide thing is interesting because the suicide deaths get lumped in. Um, I feel like there needs to be more uh, details when it comes to gun deaths because that, whatever the number is for each year, but that number will get thrown out a lot but it's like a lot of those deaths are from suicide oh, of, course, of course every responsible person breaking down these deaths breaks separates homicides and suicides but there are even more suicides and homicides and there's 10,000 about approximately gun homicides a year and far more suicides yeah i did find some interesting uh stats looking into this um, one thing I saw was uh, Japan has some of the strictest gun control laws in the world, and they have a lower murder rate but a higher suicide rate than the U.S. I think uh, the high suicide rate, you know, just speaks to cult, uh, cultural differences. Okay, but I, I guess maybe some people might say, "Oh, well, all these people are." committing suicide because it's so easy to because of guns. That's certainly part of it. Yeah. And I, I've also had um, two close friends commit suicide due to guns. So I'm um, sorry, Dalton. No, it's not, Well, I guess it's not fine. But uh, so, I, you know, I've, I've experienced this type of tragedy. Um, I, I don't, or I did read that there are twice as many guns per capita in the U.S. than there was in 1968. Yeah, 
just we talked about that earlier. It's because fewer Americans own guns, but the ones who are are just buying tons and tons of guns. But the murder rate, shooting rate has, hasn't really risen that much or at all. It's uh, certainly uh, it depends upon when you want to compare it to but compared to the 70s or 80s. The homicide rate in America is far lower. Okay. I guess that would be an argument for the pro-gun people they would make is there's so many more guns in America. No, yet... the argument falls apart because if you look at it at, at a state-by-state -state basis, you'll see states that have more guns also have more homicide. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it doesn't really work because it, if one person is going to – one person has one gun or 10 guns or 30 guns. That person has the same ability to commit murder or suicide. Yeah. Right. So that the pro just the fact that each individual has more guns that does That's not really a pro gun argument for that reason. Okay. Um, one of the biggest arguments pro gun people mention and, and the reason they believe the second amendment was created was to fight back against a tyrannical government. What do you think about that argument? <laughs> How's that going to work? I mean, that's that's what the president of the NRA said in the quote I read earlier. That's nuts, right? How's that going to work? The tyrannical government has tanks and artillery. How are you going to fight back at them with your, with your M4? Well, the pro-gun people would say, well, look how good the Viet Vietnamese did or the Af people in Afghanistan are doing right now. That's a, I'm just telling you. No, what I I've know, seen. I I know. Do you want to live like that, where you're in hiding and your life, be, you know, and human life is very cheap? The Vietnamese strategy for the war was utterly callous. Ho Chi Minh said, "For each one of your people that die, ten of ours will die. But eventually, you'll get tired and leave." So for Vietnam to win the war. They didn't have to triumph in the battlefield. America just had to go home. Yeah. Right. So it's not a it's not a good comparison. So you're gonna live in a cave and quit your job? Um. Well, that's that is one thing I've seen. Yeah. Of I think. Do you know who Michael Malice is? Uh. Have you ever heard not, the name? Not really. No. I think I don't know what where he stands politically. He's been on Joe Rogan's podcast a couple of times, but. He may, I saw him tweet this great point of like, oh, we'll use our guns to fight back against the government. But it's like the same people saying that are totally cool with the government taking over 30% of their money, but they don't do anything. So it's like, at what point are people legitimately going to band together and fight against the government and risk their lives and be willing to die for that? That's not going to happen. Yeah, it's, it seems, like a little, a, yeah. seems a little far-fetched. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's totally fucking far-fetched. That's a bunch of bullshit. I mean, so, your stance, are you, so I guess you, maybe your stance on guns is it's a fun thing to do. People should be able to do it as long as they're following the laws. But let's be realistic. Um, let's have more laws and regulation, but let's not bullshit ourselves of there shouldn't be more laws and let's not bullshit ourselves that you're going to take down the U.S. government if it comes to that point. Yep, 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 exactly. Okay. Yeah, now, let me, let me say why, if I were running for office, why I wouldn't talk about guns. If, if I were running for Democratic office, I wouldn't talk about guns for the simple reason that it's an issue that affects too few people. Um, an issue as far as regulation or the crimes of guns? What, what do you mean by that? Just the t too few people die from guns. So it's yeah. if we talk about health care, that's something that affects tens of millions of Americans. Guns, we're talking 30 or 40,000. I would have to prioritize what was important to me. And so guns wouldn't be the first thing I'd take on. Yes, we should have better gun laws, but it wouldn't be my top priority just in terms of how many people are affected. Yeah. That's a good point. I like that. Uh, I heard, I was listening to a libertarian podcast 
the other day and he brought up a, I haven't heard the quote, so you know, take it for what it's worth, but I, I trust the source. Um, I guess Bernie Sanders said that climate change will make the earth um, uninhabitable for our children and grandchildren. And the point the guy on the podcast made was like, so why are you talking about anything else? <laughs> you know, so um, it, uh, uh, it, it's like if there's, if there's way bigger issues with healthcare and way bigger numbers that affect more people, it's like, why are you talking about this tiny little thing when I'm this giant issue overshadowing all these little issues? Because it's fucked up that people get killed. It's fucked up that kids are scared at schools. It's fucked up that schools have active shooter drills now. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't want to. I don't want to downplay that stuff. But yeah. uh, I, I do. I, I just mainly, maybe I went off track or got a little confused. But like, I, I did like your point of like, there's much bigger issues to focus on. You know. Yeah. Okay. Does that about wrap up this episode of Professor and the Idiot? Um, I think so. I do like all the data you presented. Uh, you know, I, I like the arguments you make, Nick, because uh, they're not arguments I've I've heard a lot of. So that's why I try and fo- follow you closely on Twitter. That's why I really listen to you because you make me see things in a different way, and that's why I appreciate your knowledge and point of view so much. Is hey. I'm not. I'm not that well read. I'm not that well educated. So anybody listening to this podcast, it, if I say something stupid, take it with a grain of salt. I'm 24 years old. I haven't read very many books. I haven't. I don't even have an associate's degree. So the gun loving hunter, growing up with my whole family is into guns. That side of me wants to go. Fuck the government. <laughs> We're gonna fight back. Nobody's taking our guns i do there is part of me that is like that but trying to stay as open minded as possible so i appreciate all the stats and the point of view that you have on certain subjects so thank you Dalton. I, I, much I appreciated hope, i hope all our listeners if you're pro-gun or anti-gun you've learned something and you know just being open-minded and willing to listen to facts and and data you know will go a long way with any, with any issue do you have a recommendation this week? We dropped the ball on that last week. Yes, we did. Um, why don't you go first? Let me think about mine for a quick second. Mine would be the video game PUBG, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. I've been totally addicted for over a year. It's utterly gripping. <laughs> <laughs> do, and do you play on Xbox, PC? PC. You can play on Xbox. Hell, you can play on your phone. But I play on PC. It's a battle royale with a shrinking zone, and you just have to be the last surviving person or team. It seems that the the most hardcore gaming people tend to go to PC. Yeah, I think that's often true. It's a lot. It's a lot like Fortnite, but it's less cartoonish. Yeah, my buddy who's really into gaming, he didn't like Fortnite that much. He said it was a little cheesy. Tell him to play PUBG. Oh, he's played it a bunch. Oh. He's all into that. Oh, shit. Yeah. Hook me up with him. Yeah. What's, your yeah, recommend, what's your recommendation, Dalton? Um, trying to think if I should go musical or literature. You know what? I'm going to go with a podcast recommendation. If there's anybody listening that likes libertarian-type ideas or maybe wants to hear from a, a libertarian-type person, listen to... Uh, Ari Shafir, he's a comedian who's good friends with Joe Rogan. The comedian and the guy that was on his podcast, his name is Dave Smith. Every year they do a State of the Union podcast. Um, it's Ari Shafir's Skeptic Tank, episode 344 with Dave Smith. You know, like I said in the first episode, I'm not married to libertarian ideas. You know, I'm open to anything. If, it, if I, I'm looking for the truth... I'm willing to admit I'm wrong. I'm willing to listen to everybody's argument. But uh, I really like what this guy says. Um, But like I said, I'm not very educated, so for me to argue for it or against it is tough. But I think it's a very good podcast that kind of wraps up the past year of politics. Check that podcast out. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. We welcome your suggestions. And if you like what you hear, 
please go on Apple Podcasts and give us a positive review so that others can find us. Yes, please. Rate and review. It'll help us out a lot. If you don't like it, don't listen. Please don't give us a negative review. (laughs) (laughs) If if you don't like it, fuck off to the place you came from. Yeah. All right. 